Hey kid, you want to watch a movie with lots of rocks? Uh, only if it negatively affects the way I view prehistoric history. Uh, hey kid, I know this is your dad and all, but don't you think this is a little creepy? Yeah. Hey, you're the creepy guy. Yeah. Why don't you just come and watch the movie too? That sounds like fun. What are you watching? Well, get in the van and find out. Ooh, you better have candy. Oh, I do. You like the cherry bombs, right? Why do you know that? That's creepy. Oh, I'm creepy in all sorts of fun ways. Okay, now it's now it's actually creepy. <laughs> Some movies, Brennan. Yeah, okay. Well, let's go. Hi, welcome to the Corrupted Youth Podcast. I'm Dan. I'm Brennan. <laughs> We're a father and son duo that explores the latest blockbusters, classic genre films, and the schlockiest of golden age VHS rental store flicks in spoiler heavy fashion. Who am I? Who are you indeed? You're my son, Brennan. So what are we covering today, Bren? I forgot the name of the movie. Something a oh, 1 million BCE. Wait, no, BC. <laughs> 1 million BC. 1 million years BC. 1 million years BC. And See, I said BCE because that's now the new way of saying BC. They added the E to the end. So already I'm trying to take this way too scientifically. <laughs> You've, you've made the wrong decision. So we're doing this today because this movie was selected by Court Psyop from Cinema Psyops, who's also our special guest today. I'm the special needs guest. He he he, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we last had you on for our episode covering the return of Godzilla. Yeah, and my Godzilla collection has only grown since then in all the NECA figures that I've been buying. Oh, I love those. Yeah, they lost the rights, so I'm like, yeah, time to get them all. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so my desk is covered in Godzilla figures. So every time I record, I just look at them and or play with them. <laughs> that's basically the only thing that's really gone good in my life since the last time I was on your show. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. I, it's not quite that bad, but I mean, come on, man. This has been a real, <laughs> a whole lot has changed since the last time I was on your show. That's for certain. And the world is completely yes. different now. But you're holding up okay? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I work from home now and uh, that will not change. Um, even if I have to start doing like contract work where I just basically scab for companies <laughs> as, a, <laughs> as a programmer, I'll totally can do that. I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, you know, that's kind of where I, where I'm at in my headspace. If I never see people in person again, I probably will be good. <laughs> what I've actually realized is uh, the things that I don't like in this world all happen to be outside my front door. And I'm not like, I'm not agoraphobic. Like I can go outside and I do enjoy a brisk walk outside and things like that. It's, it's people I want to avoid. So I think I'm more um, misanthropic <laughs> than anything. <laughs> But uh, I can relate. Yeah, and, and it's just like I mean, like the the weirder the world around me gets, the more I just want to disconnect from pretty much the rest of the world. And I've, I'm just tightening my circle uh, a little bit. I basically did everything I was supposed to do during all of this, so you know, I I can feel all right. Uh, the positive and the best side of this is uh, we were supposed to get the cats checked out like ages ago when the pandemic first hit. Uh, it was like their normal annual checkup, and then we were going to delay it, and we tried to figure out what was going to happen with it. So it ended up being delaying pretty much almost a full year, but uh, we were able to get them checked out and they are in perfect health. Oh, good. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I've been meticulously watching what I'm feeding them because they're getting older now and uh, 
the male cat starting to get a little paunchy. <laughs> and I was I was worried about it. You know, I'm like, dude, you're looking too much like your dad. You got to stop with this. <laughs> and uh, but they're I, we got them checked out tonight and they're actually OK. Um, we think one of the things that we were worried about might just be allergies, maybe the main cause for this. And so we're going to have to get one of them treated. But other than that, they're great. And that was basically my biggest fear because it had been so long since we gotten them checked out and it just didn't work out <laughs> right for it to be able to happen and then it ended up being well once they our clinic basically opened back up we were essentially like two to three months out before our license renewal was for them, and that's why we waited just a couple months longer but i agonized over it now everything's cool <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like I said, I'm more worried about cats than I am on people at this point. <laughs> and I'm freely, freely admitting it, like, because I've, I've got no time for bullshit anymore. You know, like, I'm tired of the the dropped nose masks everywhere that just looks like the, the two inches of neck are hanging out of the top of the underwear, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm so enraged by that and I'm so sick of it. And I'm just, I'm kind of done with people, man. I don't know if I'm ever going to come back from that, but I'm, I'm at peace with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd rather, yeah. I'd rather just talk movies with my fellow podcasters, man. Excellent. Yeah. I'm, I'm you know, I kind of want the mask to stay because... <laughs> I'm just like, man, I don't want, I'm, I really like not looking at everybody's stupid face. I just pretend everybody's like Storm Shadow or some <laughs> from G.I. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird at work whenever someone comes in without a mask on because all I can do is stare at their mouth. It's like, oh, what is, what is that opening? Is that bones inside of it? Like, it's such a weird foreign look now. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to watch um, television shows and things like that that are taking place during this. It's super surreal. Like the only one that's really kind of dealing with it the way that it actually is is Superstore and I wouldn't really expect them to do anything different. I mean, I've never really been like a huge fan of that show. I've more or less just watched it as like, a, well, we got a half hour to kill. Let's put this on. But like they're dealing with it the way that I think the store employees have had to really deal with it with the masks and not knowing and the fear. And they told the story essentially just right after it happened. But like watching anything else during this time, whether it was shot during the pandemic or if it was shot just previously before it and then you watched it is super surreal and weird. The week that we found out that Bev got COVID, I actually was watching the Utopia show that's like the remake that they did on Amazon. Oh no. <laughs> Like she got tested while we were watching that. And that was like multiple levels of weird and surreal. And I'm like, when did they let Alan Moore write my life? And why, why can't I get him switched over to someone a little more sweet? <laughs> it was a really bizarre experience. Yeah. My daughter just got over it. And the, after she first got her, her diagnosis and she comes over here like two or three times a week just to like do laundry or whatever. And so after she got the diagnosis, I I was freaking out. I was like, okay, well, I'm pretty sure I have it now. And I felt really weird the day I went in to get tested. I was like, oh man, I totally got it. Never got it. It was just all in my head. Well, the entire time that my wife had it, I mean, we sleep in the same room. It's a rather small bedroom. If the house was built in 1959, I promise you there's no ventilation unless it's the air seeping in from the <laughs> from the outside from the lack of <laughs> insulation in the house. Uh, but, you know, the likelihood of me catching it is really good. I mean, just like we said on my show, I don't mean to brag or anything, but I do open mouth kiss my wife. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I was going to catch it. And I, I got tested shortly after she started showing symptoms and she got tested. I went out like the following week because it was like over the weekend that she got her results back. And I went out the following week and I got tested and it came back several days later negative and I never showed any symptoms like at all. And I don't know why. And because of the fear that I've had for so long with it, it was just essentially like almost like a sense of relief when I was worried that I might have it because I'm like, well, at least it's over with now. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen because now I know, you know, whatever's happening now is what's going to happen. And I spent a couple of days where I was pretty worried. And then when I got the test back, I was fine. I, I, I had it negative and then I waited another 14 days and got tested again and I was fine. <laughs> I never, I never caught it. I don't know how that happened. And it's just an ironic kick in the nuts for as much anxiety as I've had during the whole time with that. And it just makes me more concerned about other people that aren't being careful enough, you know? Well, now that we have you in the van, <laughs> we're definitely taking your blood. <laughs> We're going to get you tested. New test. Should should I um, basically take the credit for how creepy that got? Or was that you playing off of me? 
that that intro got that creepy. <laughs> well, I know I had nothing to do with it. So. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll I'll fully take the blame if uh, Dan gets in any trouble for it. You can just throw that blame on my shoulders. I'm not the hero that this podcast needs, but I'm the hero that it deserves. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. I suppose we've got a movie we should talk about. Yeah, I mean, we're having fun. I'm sure people are fine with the, this little game of catch up that we all did over the phone <laughs> or Zoom call. Schmettel like it. Yeah. You, Jeremy from the Tongle Den. Ah. Yeah, he was on our episode with um, From Dust Till Dawn. Yes, that's right. That's right. Okay. I do remember yeah. that episode. So now I, I have a voice to the name. So we can all say hi to him now. Hi. Hi. Glad you're listening. What's up? We miss you. <laughs> Why well, you always got to take it to the creepy spot, man? I will go over the IMDb info real quick. So according to IMDb, 1 million years BC from 1966, because this is actually a remake of 1 million BC, which I did not know that. Actually co-produced by the original filmmakers, like some of the people involved in the original one were shopping around getting it remade and then they partnered with hammer and seven arts oh very nice hmm. the description says a prehistoric man tumak is banished from his savage tribe and meets pretty loana who belongs to a gentler coastal tribe but he must fight caveman peito to win her favors well i guess that's part of it yeah i would also argue that her tribe is much more moral and decent <laughs> than the rock people yeah oh i've got some ideas about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was directed by Don Chaffee, Chaffee, whatever, stars Raquel Welch, John Richardson, R.I.P. this year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he died on January 5th. God, I didn't even think about that when I picked this movie. I just wanted to talk about Harryhausen and stuff with you guys. <laughs> I thought it would be a good dongle chat. Oh, yeah. I guess th that's the, really the main stars, just those two and Ray Harryhausen. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in a, and a surprise guest appearance by an iguana. Well, it's also important to note that Martine Beswick was already a Bond girl by this point, and she was going to be a draw to put butts in the seats as well. She is the dark haired, very attractive cave lady that um, did the little titillating cave dance to work everybody up into a frenzy for that weird ritual. So that part was that was cut out of the U.S. version, right? Yes. Yeah, that's what I, one of the many things that was cut out. I think the tribal ritual ritual was just a little too pagan maybe for the puritanical audiences in america so they cut that out <laughs> and man that is so tame by today's standards yeah. right when you hear something like that is cut out you kind of picture something in your head like what would almost end up in orgy of the dead where it's not quite a good titillating dance but it's at least like you know some more revealed skin and actually a little bit more risque but in this case it was essentially a pagan ritual and i think that's what scared people more than just the gyrating jazzy dance that they had martine beswick do <laughs> and more power to her that was incredible quite the performance you see whenever i watch an old movie like that and something like that happens I, all i can think of is they're either in a nursing home right now or they're six feet underground and that just it throws it off for me for the record either way i'm into it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the I think the majority of this cast, when I was looking them up, was like, well, this person's dead. That person's dead. They're dead. I mean, heck, Raquel Welch is in, what, her 80s now? Possibly, yeah. I mean, it is an older film, and the Blu-ray transfer is incredible. I got the Kino Lorber version of that, and I think the print on that looks terrific. I watched it on everything but my projector so far, and I really wish I could get to watch it on my projector, but I'm still setting it up. <laughs> <laughs> I finally had to move it and get it ceiling mounted and stuff, so I didn't get a chance to. But um, the two TVs that I have watched it on in my house, it looked incredible. It's the cleanest I've ever seen the film. And there's stuff that I was actually able to notice that I may not have ever seen before. The mat lines um, in particular, whenever the tribe is battling the sea turtle or the giant turtle, whenever you actually have all of the tribe spearing at his face, like the turtle's face, when you actually see that sequence, you can actually see the bluish green tint around the outside of all of the blonde people with their really light bleached fur that they're wearing and then their very tan skin there's a very serious hue outline of the blue and the green. They would have been better served to use that type of blue screen shot or green screen shot with all the dark haired cave dweller folks because the dark hair wouldn't absorb the color as much. And I just kind of noticed it more watching it on the Blu-ray for the first time because of that, because I was able to actually see the edges of everything. And on the flip side of that, all of Ray Harryhausen's stuff, I don't know if they've cleaned it up more or not, but I'll be damned if I can find a matte line because of the way that that man did his work with his foreground 
around and all of that with the miniatures, the way he was able to overlap it and the way that he put stuff in the frame. I don't think I noticed a single matte line anywhere or anything that he was cutting out. Although I could tell, obviously, that it was a miniature that was being stop motion animated. It still felt like it was very much in the frame because of the process that he used with rear projection and the animation frame by frame. You know, it's it still looks amazing or as good as it possibly could look for a model being manipulated frame by frame by hand. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's absurdly good. Not so much the sculpting, but the motion that he's able able to create and the lifelike character to each of his creatures that is what we really need to talk about and impressive. It's definitely the best part of the movie. Whenever I see any of those stop motion creatures come onto frame, I'm like, oh, this is when the movie really shines. I think that could be said for just about anything Harry Hausen was involved in because he just wanted to work. He just wanted to animate creatures and like make a decent living at it. You know, he's such a humble guy. That's all he really wanted. You know, he just wanted to make creatures and have fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's like, it's hard not to love that. He's like the original monster kid, man. Like, I know everybody always says Forrey Ackerman, but I'm going to say Ray Harryhausen because look what he did for all of us. I was on I was on Wikipedia and there was a fun uh, quote that they brought up from him regarding this movie. So it was from um, the U.S. King Kong DVD that, uh, that he did not make one million years BC for professors who probably don't go to see these kinds of movies anyway. <laughs> Perfect. So basically Brennan, when he grows up. <laughs> yeah but also go see these movies yeah but i mean i'm pretty sure that a professor can shut off their brain and just enjoy the film uh some can yeah yeah i having said that the representation of the actual dinosaurs there's some things that are obviously like a giant sea turtle okay that's a bit of a stretch right but uh there's like what a pterodactyl a triceratops an aliosaurus and then the the triceratops actually ends up fighting and i can't even pronounce that the um Character Saurus or something along those lines. They're, those the dinosaur with the spines on its nose that ends up biting the Triceratops. That's an actual dinosaur, and for the time frame that he animated this in, he made them look relatively accurate to like the kind of drawings that let's face it, kids would see in their books as to what a dinosaur should look like or what people would recognize. Uh, and the same thing with the Allosaurus. He got it decently close from some of the photos that I looked at. You know, just trying to com compare it. And then there's the pterodactyl stuff. But the things that he changed is he made it a little more like a fairy tale gruesome. Because this isn't this isn't our history, right? I mean, cavemen didn't exist with dinosaurs. We know that. <laughs> so who cares? This is a this is an alternate universe. This is another reality. This is another tale. We watch it be created right from the beginning. And when we're thrown into it, the dinosaurs that we see are the same kind of things as what you would see like a dragon in a fairy tale. It's like that's what that is, and that's just it's trying to kill you. So deal with it. <laughs> you know? That's that's definitely what I thought watching the movie, because obviously we all know that there weren't any dinosaurs around with humans. So I just looked at it more as like a what if kind of scenario, kind of like an alternate history, you know, like how would humans deal with dinosaurs wandering around and stuff like that. And I think that made the movie a lot more uh, digestible for someone more scientifically inclined like me. Oh, yeah. If you're watching a caveman movie from the 60s, you, you got to throw away all logic and reasoning to begin with, because it's a movie from the 60s, first of all. And then secondly, <laughs> it's a caveman movie. If you're going to if you're going to get upset about the scientific accuracy of one million years BC, don't ever go near the Ringo Starr caveman film. Just 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 sidestep that all together, man. I was going to bring that up. <laughs> I took Zug Zug Lana. <laughs> I used to watch Caveman all the time when I was a kid and I loved it. It was on TBS like all the time. When it wasn't playing Beastmaster, it was playing Caveman. <laughs> Oh, you got to watch that one, Brennan. Sounds like it. It's just the comedy version of this movie. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, it's got Alizada, is that the guy's name? He's like a football star who plays the main baddie, caveman that's in charge. And it's it's like if Mel Brooks took a crack at this and did a narrow miss. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how I would describe Caveman. So what I think I'm going to do for this episode is instead of just doing a rundown, because I feel this movie is better talked about for things that happen in it that we want to talk about. It's the Caveman version of a young man leaving town, going to the big city, and then coming back home with his new girlfriend. Or you could <laughs> say it's the story of a man who is banished from his tribe and returns for revenge to show how hot his new chick is, then returns for revenge to destroy destroy those that would reject him only to have the fiery god of volcano wreck everything <laughs> 
best <laughs> ending for a caveman flick ever. That was so cool. I still love that. It's like the worst timing too. Like right in the middle of battle. Well, I think that's actually the perfect timing because they're going to all interpret that as fighting is what angered that god and we better not do that again or you would hope <laughs> and maybe that's why their people will survive, you know? But man, there's some horrible deaths in that when the earth just breaks open and all the people start falling and even that like the mat lines you couldn't really see. I mean, there there's a few spots in the animal stuff that you could kind of see mat lines, but they use a lot of uh, forced perspective photography for a lot of this stuff, and I think it's done really well. Uh, the editing between the, what is it, the giant lizard? <laughs> it was just like an iguana, right? <laughs> like, yeah. 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 And so it's like a giant iguana that's like crawling up the side of the mountain, and they're cutting back and forth between him climbing up a mountain and the iguana climbing a rock sculpture that looks very much like the same mountain. That was actually really well cut back and forth between the two as far as I'm concerned. It looked much better than a lot of stuff that, and please don't hate me everyone, that Bird Eye Gordon did that was the same. <laughs> it reminds me of like parts of the giant Gila monster where like the Gila monster comes running through the set and the set actually is built convincingly enough that when the G Gila monster goes running through to go after a car, you kind of like for a second just forget that you're watching a Gila monster running across a small set. You know? <laughs> it is the same thing with this. Like that giant iguana for a couple of moments, really it when it was moving quickly at him and the way that they did the editing, I actually kind of was starting to feel like, holy f this thing's going to get him. I was starting to go with it and suspend my disbelief. Yeah, and I, I imagine that's something that was a lot easier in the day too. Because I mean, our eyes now are way more keen to special effects and especially effects from older movies like this. But it reminds me of the very first movie that was shown in theaters of like the train going through the station and everyone was like freaking out throughout the years. I bet these effects in the 60s really blew people away. I think that's what matters. Yeah, that, that and I mean, imagine like seeing this in like a Vista Vision wide format on a huge screen, you know, like one of these giant movie houses they used to have in the 60s where the screen was like the size of a warehouse building <laughs> on the wall with all these balconies. <laughs> and I mean, like some of these grand old theaters that they would show these things in, I think the theater was more of a draw than whatever you were watching half the time. It's just to go <laughs> into something like that, you know, it's like, oh, look at this place. And then they show a movie there and you see a movie like this on that big of a scope and, you know, like let's say you're even just watching it as a matinee as a kid kid, right? You just happen to catch it. Your your mom throws whatever it costs, a quarter or whatever it was back then to go watch the movie. And you just go and you park your butt and watch this movie during a matinee. Your mind would be blown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you'd be terrified. I know watching this, I, I saw parts of it when I was very, very young, probably about seven or eight. And I remember the iguana terrifying me as a kid and the Aliosaurus attack. I was just like, oh man, no. Like the, the meanest creatures Harryhausen has done is in this movie for sure. Yeah, when they're fighting all the dinosaurs and everything, and they're throwing spears at them, I had a hard time noticing where the actual footage of the actors stopped and where it was crossing over into the Harryhausen stuff. He did such a good job. Yeah, he, he does uh, a lot of stuff that he does is rear projection where he will have the actors shot, and that's sort of like his background plate, and then he'll have like a foreground thing that he'll work on. So more than likely, what he did was animate the spear behind in the line with the other spear and just build it to look as much alike as he possibly could. Because when it gets thrown from the person to the, the dinosaur, there's going to be a point where the perspective will match up just right. And it'll be the exact same size and the right place to do it. So I would imagine that he would start right there and then just kind of go. Because there's always a mat line. They always have a, a line that they draw or like an imaginary line that they'll do where things aren't supposed to cross. You know, sometimes they actually do put up a rope or whatever. And then that other half of the screen is a plate. And sometimes they block it off or they won't even expose the film. And they'll just shoot half of one side of the film with, the character actors and all, all they're supposed to be doing and then they'll the other half will be Harryhausen stuff animated in with like a background and everything and then sometimes they will shoot a full screen shot of the guys doing something off to one side of the frame and then Harryhausen will animate his stuff in the foreground like super close with forced perspective and make it look really huge that way uh, it just kind of depends how they do it you know and it's really old school hands on technique that is so impressive with this uh, I, I think the, his work in this is almost better than I would say even Clash of the Titans, which is supposed to be like his swan song thing that everybody celebrates. And don't get me wrong, I absolutely love that, but I feel like his animation in this is better. And he had less money. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, he does such a he has, he has such an attention for detail. And I think that it's something that even like with computers now, there was a long time where nobody was really paying attention to it. But these these creatures breathe. Yeah. You see them breathing and not just when they need to, when they're out and about doing stuff, they're still just breathing and it just adds so much more life to them. Mm -hmm. Or like I remember the uh, Allosaurus's tail was just mind blowing, uh, like especially when it first comes into the the shell tribe. I mean, when I was young, I tried my hand at stop motion animation a lot. Like I I made some really cheesy movies using my Godzilla toys, and I so I know I know just a little bit just how hard that kind of stuff is, and the just amazing. I don't know. It just feels so real. Like I can see the anatomy of the tail, and it and it looks real, and it moves so real. And he's doing that while also. So having to animate, you know, everything else going on and then make sure it matches the background. There's so many layers to his work. It's it's mind blowing. Yeah, I totally agree. And one of the things I wanted to point out that since we're just going to dig in super deep on uh, geeking out on Harry Housen, which is what I'm, <laughs> which is totally what I was hoping for. I know a lot of people were like, oh, cord pick one million years BC. All they're going to do is slobber over the ladies. Uh, <laughs> no, this is all about the Harry Housen. Well, we've discussed how lovely everybody looks in their fur bikinis are already we're good <laughs> yeah that's fine but the, you know they're all dirty and gross anyway mm -hmm. <laughs> again not a deal breaker for me <laughs> Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out, okay, so the, the producers or someone was pulling money back from the film or something was going on where they had to shuffle money from Harryhausen's budget somehow or some way, who knows why, but they cut his budget down significantly to the point where he had half of the resources that he needed to be able to complete the turtle sequence or the, the animation of the turtle. So his solution was, okay, well, I'll just animate the front half of it and that's all I'll show. And if you, <laughs> if you look, I mean, they do a really great job of editing around it and shooting just mostly the front half of the turtle whenever it's moving but if you look there's a couple sequences where he's coming forward and if you pay attention he's just dragging his middle his back legs don't ever move it comes into frame like once or twice and you never see the back legs move because Harryhausen is just animating the front half of the turtle she's like okay you wanted half the resources and you want the same amount of time you're getting half the animation and even when he does half the animation because he's forced to it's incredible <laughs> yeah this is a good one this is a good good one for his work yeah and it goes kind of mostly unnoticed because i think it's overshadowed by the fact that raquel welch wears a fur bikini for a good portion of the film and believe me i very much appreciated that both times i watched it for doing the <laughs> review with you guys I, I totally did i i am not going to say that i had a problem with seeing her in a fur bikini or that her and Martin Bestwick's fight in both their fur bikinis that's nearly to the death didn't really warm the sub cockles of my heart. I'm not saying any of that. <laughs> I'm just saying like, this is some amazing work from Harryhausen and I don't know if anybody ever really focuses on that because they're too distracted by how amazingly beautiful two of the actresses are, you know? And it's like, there's way more to the film than that. And I don't, did, did you guys know who did the volcano eruption and all of that kind of stuff? Was that some of Harryhausen's work? No, there, there was another guy who worked on special effects yeah there's there's multiple fx companies doing practically done miniatures and various other types of effects in this that are all amazingly impressive what i find also impressive about harry Hausen is nobody i don't think anybody's ever come close to his level of like animation you know i mean obviously there's been other great stop motion animators out there but we've never seen a harry Hausen 2.0 like i remember um when they began production on gojira they originally wanted to use stop motion animation uh, and they even did some like test trials of it but they found that in order to match the sort of stop motion done in like king kong it would have taken them way longer and they just gave up it's such a hard process to go through and nobody else can really do it quite like Harryhausen can but have you seen the california reasons brennan <laughs> Have you? Wow, that's claymation. That's really different. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to make it funny. <laughs> so Harryhausen's system had its own patent that he wasn't allowed to use for this film. They had to come up with a different term for it. But I think, is it his term as dynamation or something like that? Or something along those lines. But there's like a patented term for his specific style of animation that he was not allowed to use because the producer that he normally works with would not let them use it for less than X amount of money. And Harryhausen being Harryhausen, he's like, man, I just want to work. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, so he found a way around it, and then Hammer came up with a different phrase that was like they're all their own. I can't even remember what it is, but to kind of ex- explain or, or you know the process or whatever. And Harryhausen's specific style and the way that he's able to do this with the characters. I mean, the closest that has been able to mimic that is uh, I forget what it, uh, is it Go Motion or there's a type of stop motion animation where every couple of frames they have like this pneumatic ram hit the table and shake it just to blur a frame or something like that or do something different i forget exactly how it works but they do something to blur the frame where they hit the camera or they shake the table that the animation is happening on to give it like a little bit of a shutter and make it feel more realistic uh one of the examples that you see that type of animation is actually in robocop the ed 209 has done that style that i'm I'm referring to oh interesting so there you go (laughs) more stop motion animation geekery for me i i'm obviously a huge fan of that kind of work it's incredible the amount of attention to detail that you need to be able to do that. Uh, And another contemporary, I think, that's doing a pretty good job of lifelike stop motion animation, although it's not a specific all-in-one man, because I don't think we will ever have that again. Um, This was a Renaissance man, (laughs) Harryhausen. But a team of animators can very much create that same lifelike character. And and I would say that Lykia, or Lyka, or or however it's pronounced, the Kobu and the Two Strings, uh, Coraline. Is it Box Trolls? I think they also did as well. Those are all stop motion animation that they do stop motion animation with. I mean, they use green screen and some other modern techniques, but they are still continuing to do stop motion animation and their stuff is quite incredible. So I think uh, that's something, an avenue to check out. If you are a huge fan of stop motion animation and you want to kind of see where that's kind of gone now, that's probably the closest to the same type of bringing characters to life as what Harryhausen does. I would say I probably would pass it on to them. I mean, some people might say like Tim Burton's factory of animation and what they do but maybe uh, I, I feel like the Leica or Leica or whatever I think they probably do a more lifelike creation than what I, I, that's the only one I can think of off the top of my head otherwise it does for stop motion is some of Burton's stuff well I know that their work is often confused with being actual CG animation because it's so smooth yeah absolutely and the way everything looks CG animators imitate that kind of style and everything so there's some people who don't know honestly I didn't know until I started watching some of the behind the scenes and that made it even more impressive to me. What I think is sad is that those movies don't perform like exceedingly well and it's such a hard and long process for all those animators to do and they don't get the sort of returns that they really deserve in the box office and I think that's really sad I, I hope it doesn't kill the industry kill the the style off just because it it is so hard to do and it doesn't make its money back a whole bunch very often anymore yeah it is unfortunate that you have to put in all this time and all this work and then sometimes that type of work goes underappreciated but if you are someone who truly loves that style I think you would do it just for the sake of being able to do it and that's why mm-hmm. it's it's good to have a studio that that's their sole focus you know they maintain budgets specifically for that and if you're making that type of animation, there are probably ways to make it even more commercial. But I think in like yes case, they pick the stories that mean more to them than anything. And they just run with that because they just want to tell the tales their way. <laughs> you know, like I don't feel like they're going with anything overtly commercial. I mean, they're not like Disney. When Disney does a stop motion animation movie, it better get a return. Otherwise, they'll never do another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What annoyed me is the fact that the Lego movie intentionally cut out frames of animation and did other effects to make their movie look stop motion. And it wasn't because I remember when the trailer came out, I was so excited because I thought from the look of it, it looks like it was all stop motion. And I thought, oh, that's so cool. Because especially that's when I was especially into actually making my own. And no, nope, it was just some guy at a computer going, hmm, I'm going to remove this frame. Ooh, now it looks like I did something more difficult i mean granted yeah that was more for the style but still kind of stealing the thunder a little bit i mean I, I totally get that it's like when musicians are angry about what someone like one guy can do with a synthesizer you know that whole they're taking our gerbs or they're they're, <laughs> they're stealing our style they're they're stealing what we do it, it, and i can see where artists get to say weird al yankovic because when he does his style parodies he can totally mimic their sound that they've spent years developing in a matter of how long it takes him to write a song.
song about baloney or whatever he chooses. <laughs> and, and it's got to be frustrating. It's got to be upsetting to you for, for that case. I totally get it. But if there is a way to tell your story and you cannot do the thing that you would like to do, then perhaps mimicking that as best you can to emulate and pay homage to it is the next best thing. So I don't have a problem with it being CG and then made to look like stop motion animation. Um, I just am always grateful when it is actual stop motion animation. And I'm also even more shocked when I feel that that was CG because of how much it felt like I was right there looking at it. <laughs> like, like, like how much realistic and how like detailed it all was. And it turns out, no, they did that in stop motion animation. It's not CG that made that happen. That always impresses me more. And I think the thing that stop motion will always have over CG, because CG still isn't quite there yet, is the texture of the things that they can do. Like when a coat moves, you can actually see the fabric moving and they'll they'll have textures to the fabrics. Even if they're using wires to do their cheats to move things or whatever it might be, it still has some texture to it. Um, and nobody gets water right, not even CG, not even miniature water. Nobody gets water right. <laughs> water is so difficult to get to look right whenever you you animate it. It just doesn't work, man. What I find really impressive is in The Empire Strikes Back when they did the stop motion of the ad ats And yeah, I'll say ad ats I also say AT-ATs. I, I double dip, okay? Uh, <laughs> both are correct. Both are correct. Uh, when they were animating it, they had covered the entire area where the adats are in, I think it was like flower or it was some, it was something like snow and they had to hang from the ceiling to move the the limbs or they had like little peak holes they could pop out of and they, they could not touch any of the snow. Otherwise, obviously the snow would just move on its own mid animation and that looks weird. So they had to go through all this meticulous work to make sure that none of the snow moved and the end result, it, it just looks like snow. No, they did such a good job and that goes along with that idea of texture like it it moves so real compared to something that you could do with cgi industrial light and magic truly did some amazing work for stop motion animation in the 80s i i will give you that they're just unparalleled work <laughs> <laughs> that you might not even realize that that is what you are seeing. <laughs> oh yeah, well the Rancor, they do a lot of stop motion with that, but they just had figured out how to use computers in order to work the frames better. I think the Rancor is probably their tribute to Harryhausen because it feels the most like a Harryhausen creature in the way that it moves and reacts. Yeah, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be surprising now that you say that. It does feel and seem like it would even... I could see Harryhausen animating a creature just like that. Oh yeah, Sinbad would totally take something like that on on one of his voyages. Yeah, you would totally see that. Oh, were we talking about a movie? <laughs> well, I mean, it's all it, it's it's all pertinent. We, we went off on a little bit of a tangent about stop motion animation, but I think we can come right back to... What one million years BC and the thing that everybody wants to talk about the fur bikinis. <laughs> <laughs> so when we were watching it and they were getting into uh Tumac's tribe, the rock tribe, I had put in my notes, the rock tribe, this is the America a lot of people want, but with guns. Yes. Was that the observation you were hinting at earlier? <laughs> there's that. And there's I. Well, I think I covered the other one about like going back to your podunk town with your big city girlfriend. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like the dude coming back like, this is my new hot chick. She digs me. You guys are d yeah, and th and also there they were like, oh, well, Tumac thinks he's so much better than us because he's been to the big city. <laughs> He's learned some things like empathy, <laughs> which the America tribe in the rocks totally lacks. Oh, yeah. When they're like when they're throwing rocks at the elderly <laughs> for fun, there's just no respect for anyone. And it was all about doing everything strictly for yourself. Yeah, that's totally America. <laughs> that's freedom. That's what freedom is. We brought you freedom. The, You're welcome. Are the shells Canadians then? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, they seem kind of ultra hippie and maybe they're just Californians. <laughs> them, them are your libtards, Brennan. Well, because they're right by the ocean, clearly they are the coastal elites, Brennan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got dumb stuff like art and an elder leader who commands respect out of all the people that live in that tribe. They got socialism because they all work together for the common good of their own. They have a school. They are teaching them kids how to do them dumb artworks. <laughs> they feed each other and are very generous with their portions. They brought in a stranger and took nursed them back to health. He's an illegal alien. He did not arrive there with permission. They harbored him. That makes them <laughs> fugitives. 
<laughs> well, tying into those two tribes too, you you have the the third one of I don't know what to call them, what a good term would be, but they're basically ape men living in that weird cave. Are they Neanderthals or are they just like a group of missing link cannibals? Right, that's just whatever they are. They're nightmare fuel. Those things are terrifying. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> they're just like crazed furries living in a cave. Well, now <laughs> now that brings on a connotation of something that um, let's just say is a style of life that we can't judge. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's true i say it to be funny i actually like you want to wear a fursuit thumbs up go for it i mean yeah whatever you want to do as long as you're not hurting anybody else you're good exactly that's why i look at it i these uh ape creatures in the cave remind me a lot of the creatures in uh the time machine which their name subs me morlock by. maybe morlocks yes yeah it reminds me of those just weird ape creatures they like killing humans and that's all you really need to know about them and they'll kill their own kind yeah like the one just dropped a fruit and and then next thing you know, it's head was being put on a pike. Well, that was that was mirroring what happened to Tumak. Yeah. Before he got exiled or basically, well, he was just pushed off a cliff and yeah. left for dead. <laughs> well, he did challenge the leader and then the leader kicked his ass, but cheated and knocking him off a cliff. Yeah. And, you know, they they were hiding in the tree and they were seeing all the ape creatures. And I guess that was to just kind of show Tumak how terrible his people were because he views these as just monsters, but they're doing the exact same thing, fighting over just simple food that everybody, there's enough for everybody, but it was just me, me, me. Oh, I thought they were cannibals. I thought that they killed that other one just because they wanted meat. That's how I always took it. Because, I mean, why else would there be skeletons piled up like they are and skulls? Like, they're not paying tribute to their dead. They're counting their kills after they eat them. <laughs> That's how I looked at it. Maybe I'm just, like, dark, but, you know. Oh, I guess I was just kind of... <laughs> I don't know what i was looking for in this movie <laughs> <laughs> that's just that's the way i took it so we're all correct <laughs> yeah i mean i just i don't know i i usually see a lot darker and more twisted stuff than what may be actually in a film so i totally accept that that may be the case but yeah i totally thought they were cannibals and are you agreeing with me or are you saying you don't think that that's the case oh it very well could be the case i think it could be even a mixture of both i think they got into a little tussle and next thing you know rage induced tussle and then they they kill the one and oops well guess we'll just eat them now waste not want not yeah yeah and i don't know do you have any idea what they're supposed to be is there like a not necessarily a missing link but like is there an evolutionary chain like pre-neanderthal that these things are supposed to be i mean i don't know i think they're just i think it's just more of the idea of like a missing link kind of person i don't know if there's supposed to be anything in like specific they're big feet yeah <laughs> uh no bigfoot is from another dimension that explains why you never see him <laughs> <laughs> I think, we, I think we brought that up in our previous episode, too. Yeah, we went on some crazy tangents. On yeah, that. we did. That was a fun one. Tumak dealing with the Shell Tribe and earning a place there because he's hanging out. He's, like, cool with the kids and everybody thinks he's funny. He's kind of a goof. He kills that dinosaur. But then he's just like, oh, man, this spear is really awesome. I'm totally going to try to steal this, and he's so bad at it. <laughs> well, I, I think the tribe that he comes from, he doesn't know any better, right? Right. And they do a really good job. That, Like I said, the shell people are actually really moral because they're like, all right, if you're going to be a dick like this, just go. But they give him plenty of chances where he's like, I want the, I'm want i keeping this. this. This death stick is now mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, like, he lacked the capacity to understand that they would teach him how to make one. And and in true toxic masculine form, it takes the love of a good woman to make him into like a halfway decent dude. Yeah, she really, yeah, she really does bring out more of the humanity to him. I think they're they're trying to like shortcut it by saying she's so beautiful that like people want to be better around her, sort of, because everybody's like really taken with her, even when she gets introduced to the other tribe and they're all like checking out her hair because she's so different from them. Everybody's like super ultra fascinated with her and like drooling over her and stuff. Like they really kind of push that. A little hard in that sequence <laughs> and uh it's like the love of a good woman and then the fact that she's like super hot everybody just wants to do whatever she says <laughs> Well, I mean, also in human history, usually when we find people that are different, we tend to just kill them. So that scene was a little interesting. It's like, oh, they actually appreciate that she's different. Well, Martine huh. Beswick certainly didn't. Her character goes for, <laughs> the, for the jugular with that, that antler thing. Several <laughs> kills. That fight is actually pretty brutal. Like, I know a lot of people are like, yeah, cat fight. I'm like, holy, shit, they're really trying to kill each other. 
Oh, yeah. And there's so much in this movie that looks like it hurts. Mm-hmm. The sets that they're throwing themselves around on, if if, they, if that cave is actually a set, it's at least a very rigid styrofoam that is painted to look like rock. And I guarantee you that is screwing up their skin when they're dropping on it. And then if it really is a cave, they're really falling on rocks like that. Yeah, there's a couple times where they have scrapes on them and stuff. And either they did an excellent job with the makeup for the time, or those are just real scrapes from climbing around rocks and stuff. I would think that when he cuts his hand on the volcanic glass, when he's climbing down the volcano and like he falls down and there's like, you can see the sort of glass, like structure pieces in some of the rocks. And then where his hands are cut, you know, they look like little glass cuts. Mm -hmm. I would say that those were makeup, but a lot of the scrapes and things like that, that you see, and like what might be considered bruising and some of that, particularly on the legs and hands or whatever, for from when they're wrestling i would say that stuff was real particularly the fight with raquel welch and martine beswick i think they actually were getting scraped up a little bit i wouldn't i would not put it past a low budget film like this to sacrifice the actor's health and, <laughs> and bodies to make a good scene happen and they're young enough actresses at the time that they probably didn't know that they could say no to that right yeah. and some of it may be the stunt people too because there's a couple of sequences where they're really tossing each other around and like when they do a good flying you know rollover type thing across the ground that may have been stunt people and i'm sure they were actually injured for real too so yeah i would say a good portion of the scrapes are real <laughs> yeah because when when tumak and raquel welch's character when they're climbing out of the the eight people cave and he's coming out it looks like he's got like old dried blood on his knees and stuff yeah i did notice that and that could also just be mud or various pieces of dirt and things that are caked on him from the set um, that mixed in with like some fake blood or whatever. But yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't have actual injuries on his knees. I mean, if they're climbing on real rocks, you're going to get cut up like that in your bare knees. <laughs> and then if you're climbing on those like fake set things, cause everybody's been to like some kind of an amusement park or whatever, where they make fake stone, where it's that, that spray foam stuff that gets like really, really big. And then they shave it down and then they just spray paint it with like that hard glaze that makes it like almost like a hard plastic. That stuff will cut you up too, if you're not careful. <laughs> You know, if they're climbing on that for the set that just looks like stone, but is a little softer, that's still going to scrape them up on their bare knees, too. For sure. It's a pretty fun movie, though. Yeah, I mean, look how much fun we've had talking about it for like the last <laughs> hour or so, right? And and we're going all over the place, but it, it warrants all of those subjects, I think. Uh, I, I hate the term to use it holds up, but I would say that like watching it now, I still find a lot of things that I can enjoy about it. So, I mean, this film still works for me is kind of the best way to put it. Like, I still get invested in the stop motion animation and I still get to geek out with it at the same time. Like, while I'm watching it, I'm really, like, really critical about it, but then certain actions will happen and then I'll get into it on the level of, like, where I'm in the story and I'm invested and I suspend my disbelief for a moment. The same thing with the forced perspective animals. That's like the sort of 50s trope of special effects. And then the ending sequence with the, the animated earthquake where things are falling apart and then the people are running across the sets and then they sort of, sort of fall into the cracks as the rocks are shooting up out of the ground. And those various pieces of effects that are very practically done, those are super impressive as well. And it's still holds your attention and this transfer if anything enhances my enjoyment of that because i can see it so much better and i was expecting to dread like all of the mat lines that were going to be revealed and a bunch of other things that i was really terrified about but they either cleaned them up or they just weren't there it looks great i also think it's very impressive from like a storytelling perspective because none of the characters speak an actual language so trying to tell a story and you know portray these ideas must have been very difficult and i think they did a good job obviously the story is not complex it's very it's pretty simple but i think it was it was done very well and kudos to the actors too i mean trying to portray these emotions without actually being able to say anything i think was a really interesting challenge and it, it was fun to watch how they how they kind of managed to tell tell a story this way also i think it helps if like a lot of your actors aren't that great at actors you just keep them silent and have them look at the camera and then <laughs> you score it however you want and frame it however you want to make it look like something like you know oh they're obviously really scared because there was a monster in the last take you know but maybe it's the same look each time they could be covering up the fact that a certain person that looks great in a fur bikini can't act <laughs> so court 
Have you seen any images or watched the original of this? Uh, I have not. Um, I know that it existed. I found out about it by listening to some portions of the commentary um, just before we went to record, but I want to find it. So do you know of where it is or where it exists out there? No, but I did look up some images for it. And let's just say they did a way better job on their costuming and making people actually look like cavemen in this. Because the older one, I mean, it's from 1940. It looks like they just pulled people in off the street and they're like, get in these Flintstone costumes. <laughs> I was going to say, it probably does look like the Flintstones. It totally looks like the Flintstones. Uh, I probably would still dig it, though, because I like old movies, too. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's fun. I mean, this definitely got me curious about it and I want to check it out. But man, it just it's so laughable to just see cleanly shaven caveman. <laughs> slam beef chest in a in a flintstone outfit <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like the lady's hair is just totally all done up of like the time. It was great. You, yeah, you should go look it up sometime. <laughs> Betty Page is Betty Rubble in One Million Years BC. <laughs> Actually, now I just really wish that would exist. Yeah, that would be fun. Well, I suppose, I mean, I don't have much more to say about the movie. Do you, Bren? No, it's pretty simple. Do you, Court? Yeah, I mean, we got to talk about almost all of stop motion animation. I'm thoroughly satisfied with this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> works for me so court do you have a favorite scene definitely the triceratops versus the i can't pronounce the other dinosaur's name but it begins with the letter c fight is just the top and i loved seeing the triceratops get the better of him by spearing him one and just wandering off to let him die oh man i'm so with you on that that's mine too I think my favorite scene was the Allosaurus fight in the Shelp tribe. Uh, I think I think it was just more interesting to see, you know, humans try to battle such a creature. And I, I like the way that Tumok gets gets the kill. I think that was pretty fun. And also, uh, I think it, I mean, all the stop motion is really impressive. But I think that I think I think that had the best uh, stop motion, at least my opinion. No, actually, it is the most technically sound and impressive. I totally agree with you there um, because of the interaction with the live things on set where the Allosaurus knocks over the the hut onto mm -hmm. the guys by biting a piece of it out and that stop motion with the piece coming out and the hut falling down yeah. where that piece is then missing the spears being flung at him that then turn into stop motion spears that actually stick into him technically speaking that is the best scene <laughs> in the entirety of the film and i do not argue with that at all but he said favorite scene and i'm going with the old-fashioned one that made me pop as a little kid the most which is that fight <laughs> 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 now if we're talking technically best and best scene then yes i absolutely 100 percent agree with you i just said my favorite <laughs> yeah. triceratops is my favorite dinosaur <laughs> that's why i went with that it was also the coolest dino rider too was the triceratops one i was working on a thing for work um for a side project we were going to do a text-based game like oregon trail oh awesome that was all about how dinosaurs are actually were, were actually technically advanced and they knew that the meteor was coming so they left and it's about them going on a space adventure and you would travel to different worlds and different dinosaurs would have different things that they were good at and it just never it never came to be but man i got to draw some really cool pictures of space dinosaurs <laughs> just turned it into a choose your own adventure book but you can't call it choose your own adventure so you have to come up with a new name for it <laughs> find your yeah. own path with <laughs> the art of Bissell. <laughs> Maybe I'll post a couple of uh, pics in the dongle then. That'd be cool. I have a work-related dinosaur story. I work at a restaurant, and I I was talking to my buddies there, because a good amount of my friends work there, and I asked them, I said, well, what's your favorite dinosaur? Because everyone has a favorite dinosaur. I have a favorite dinosaur. Unless they get too old, then they don't have a favorite dinosaur anymore. Yeah. My, and I was like, oh, my favorite dinosaur is the Spinosaurus. I think it's super cool. Or no, I think I said the Quetzalcoatl because that was my favorite at the time. And and my other friend was just like, oh, my favorite's the blah, 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 like a boring answer. And and then this other, my other coworker goes, I don't have a favorite dinosaur. Why'd I, why would I have a favorite dinosaur? I'm like, you don't have a favorite dinosaur? Like everybody has a favorite dinosaur. He's like, no, I don't. I'm like, no, like you're the only one. And then a customer comes in. It was like this older guy. And I look at him and go, Sir, do you have a favorite dinosaur? Like before I even said like, hello, what could I get you today? <laughs> Anything like that. It caught him off guard. And he looks at me and he goes, hmm, 
probably like a velociraptor. <laughs> and I just turned to my friend and go, see, look, my friend has a favorite dinosaur. Yeah, I'm glad my manager wasn't around when I did that. <laughs> All right. Just for the record, my favorite dinosaur is kind of a cheat because it's not a real dinosaur, but it's also an answer that everyone has to accept because it's me. It's a Godzillasaurus. We accept. Yes. <laughs> 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 like, I don't care if it's not real. That's my favorite dinosaur. <laughs> and sometimes it isn't even real in the lore. Right. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm being a little facetious, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm still like a T-Rex fan. I know I'm lame like that, but like I've always been a T-Rex fan ever since I was a little kid. And it's also because of Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Okay, so let's move on to our rating of the movie. Now, Court, you're familiar with our rating system? Oh, yeah, I'm good. So by saying the word movie, how would you rate this movie? And would you recommend it? Movie. And I recommend. Oh, man, it just got it's got steamy in here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it does to me. This movie's sultry for multiple reasons. Brennan? Hmm. Oh, it's a movie because I'm excited when I watch it. Uh, And yes, I would recommend it. It's pretty fun. Okay, that's good. I wasn't quite sure yesterday. <laughs> I think you're just tired because a lot of times like we won't talk after we watch a movie intentionally. That's and a I, good way to do it for the show. Oh, for sure. And I just could not read him whatsoever. And I was like, I don't know what he thinks of this. <laughs> I'm like, I don't think he liked it. So Come on, it's me. How would I not like it? <laughs> well, I'm glad that you did. You kept the mystery. And if and if we ever watch a movie like that and I don't like it, I've been replaced. That's not me. <laughs> Pod Brennan. So you're recommending it? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to say One Million Years BC is a movie. Mm. Yes, I recommend this. I, I recommend it only because I think it has wide appeal. Oh, yeah. For a movie where nobody talks, I think just about anybody can get into this for whatever their personal reason is. Do you like dinosaurs? Do you like fur bikinis? Do you like hairy dudes? Whatever you like. Do you like volcanoes killing everybody? Rocks? <laughs> oh, so many rocks. I like all those things. <laughs> Perfect movie for you, Court. Yeah, that's why I picked it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is a Dongle Den discussion to be for sure <laughs> <laughs> Court, why don't you tell us about your show? Well, Cinema PsyOps, we have been going for coming up on six years now. Is it? No, we're on our sixth year. We're closing out our sixth year, heading on to our seventh year. I've been doing this for way too long. Uh, we are an explicit show that very much patterns itself after sort of a 90s version of a shock jock radio host who's trying really, really hard to push that envelope, but not really because they just do it naturally. They have abrasive personality. That's kind of <laughs> my, myself and my my partner for the podcast. And uh, we do movie review shows, and that's kind of the tone of the show. We have that morning zoo, old school, like 90s shock jock vibe to what we do, but we dial it back just a little bit. And we might not really be your taste because we're a bit woke on the show. <laughs> <laughs> that that tends to bug some folks, you know, but hey, maybe we're your taste. If if you made it through this show with Dan and Brendan, maybe maybe you'll like Cinema PsyOps, but uh, definitely someone who's Brendan's age might need to get their parents' permission before they listen to it because I won't be held responsible for what we do to their brains. <laughs> like you asked permission to listen to something like that when you were 17. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm your dad, you're, so. <laughs> you're, you're talking to a guy who rented I Spit on Your Grave at 12 and nobody knew. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah hey, that's the kind of show you get with me we're called corrupted youth for a reason <laughs> yeah so cinema psyops available uh legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops that's the main landing and launching page all of our links are there we're even in pandora now i don't know how bo did that but he got us in pandora i just found out about that like there's a bunch of different stuff that bo added so the main reason that the copyright thing that has been the bane of my existence on the show that i've been kind of like making a big deal about having to go with is because if we make that small change it makes it to where we can put our shows into any of these various places and that's the thing that Bo has been trying to do for Legion Podcast is get us out there to as many different places as possible so it's super easy to find us and now I have to add a ton of more links of all the stuff that's available because it's like <laughs> everywhere I mean I didn't even know podcasts could be in Pandora but we're there now so that's cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah the more so, the merrier 
Right. So, and I'll be, I'll be posting that and all the stuff. Uh, the main interaction for me is because I'm an old bogey, I guess you could say, is Facebook. We have the Facebook group of Cinema PsyOps. That's the best place to reach us and, you know, join the group for <laughs> being a miscreant like ourselves. Of course, you guys have the Dongle Den, which I, I highly recommend, but it's for a more tame and uh, moderate psychopath to be in that group <laughs> compared to ours. <laughs> yeah, we're good. We're getting, we're growing a bit. I mean, you're helping out a lot. You post a lot of memes in there. And yeah, I, uh, I'm like, the Pied Piper of memes, I guess. I just lead them to their death and then like expose you to what it was that I found. You know, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe I'm a meme ab- aggregator, I guess. I don't know. I just, I, I, I have an eye for them and I know what makes me laugh. And I know that there's a lot of other people out there that would probably laugh at that too. So I just try to share it around as many places as possible. Spread a little internet joy because there's so much crap on there. And it. very true. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, no, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me back i thought i blew my chance the last time i was on by being an awful guest (laughs) oh no you were great no i mean you spent you spent what at least two months just playing our promo on your show yeah (laughs) there was a space there i think i don't know if i ever contacted you to tell you or not but there was a space there where you had to stop doing shows for for whatever reason like like life was getting in your way and you had to stop putting out this show and i think i said to myself and i don't know if i ever told you this i'm like i'm gonna play this promo till dad feels guilty enough to put out a new show (laughs) 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 And if you look at the time when you started coming back and doing regular shows, that's about the time that I stopped playing the Corrupted Youth promo. (laughs) I was trying to shame you guys back onto the air. (laughs) Well, I mean, that's a lot, too, because, yeah, that's what I was thinking of is your weekly you have not missed a week the entire time you've been doing the show uh 289 and counting has been recorded and edited yeah man as of this recording with you (laughs) (laughs) 289 consecutive weeks and it's not just me matt has shown up for the majority of it Uh, but it has (laughs) definitely always been me like it's every week i put out something Yeah, we're going on what year four. Yeah, and we're we're just this will be forty five. <laughs> this is year six for me. <laughs> and if you divide the total number that I'm in by like fifty two, that that would probably tell you that you know I'm I'm willing to year six. <laughs> and I, I, I there was a number of years that I was gonna I was gonna keep doing this show, um, or a number of episodes that I had in my mind of what I was gonna do for my show, and I've surpassed one of them, but I'm not even close to the other one so i just don't know what to do now (laughs) (laughs) well i for one love your show and i recommend it to people all the time and i never never really hear back from them Yeah, we do. They're never like, wow, that Cinema Psyops, that was great. Thanks for the recommendation. Until like you see them show up in the group and you're like, it's not Fight Club. You could have told me you liked it. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, we've got our t-shirts and whatnot available, T Public. Check out the link in the show notes. And if you want to send us a message about how we're just not good historically accurate cavemen, you can email us at corruptedyouthpod at gmail.com. Ooh, Ooh, that's good. I like it. <laughs> Brennan, turn on that fan. <laughs> Court, I think you just stole all of our female viewers. <laughs> Viewer. <laughs> yeah. Hello, hello, young woman. <laughs> it's like we said viewer and it's a podcast. <laughs> Maybe, maybe they are psychic and they can see you when you speak. They know what you look like when you recorded. Okay, so now we have zero. <laughs> they are a remote viewer. With that, thank you to all our listeners and our fellow podcasters like Court here. That's me. And hang in there, dongles. No, you're not going to say goodbye, Bren. Oh. Usually you well, usually I say hi to Court. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bren. Hi, Court. Oh, man, this is fun. Dead you! Come rock, dead you!